I'm going to try to generate an image from the data in 10 minutes. Now, I got a little more time than that, and I'm going to give an introduction. But that's the idea, to see how quickly we can generate an image from the data from the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, the first thing you have to do is I have a couple of links. I'm going to copy those links and put them in the chat because you're going to need those. All the data from the space telescopes, from the big telescopes on Earth, anything that's financed by the government is available to all of us. It's free. You can download the raw data. You can download the stack data. You can download the images. It's all in this master of the Murkowski archive. And if you haven't been there before and you want to start poking around, this is a good place to start. And all you have to do is simply enter your target. And here I entered Carina Nebula, and I'm going to do a search. And it's going to think for a while, and it's going to generate a list of all the data that's available to the Carina Nebula. And you can see there's quite a bit of it. But we only want the thing from the James Webb Space Telescope. So over on the left, I don't know if you can't see this, you could bring this up on your own computer. You could look at the mission. And there it is, James Webb Space Telescope. And when I click on that, then it brings up only the ones from the James Webb Space Telescope. So now we're down to a workable number. And I'm going to move this over so we can see exactly where we are in the sky and zoom out a little bit. So when you look at the Carina Nebula, this is what you normally see, some version of this, if you live in the Southern Hemisphere. But what James Webb was, we just looked at a very, very tiny portion of it, and you see it kind of up here on the upper right of Carina Nebula. So if you zoom in on this, I'll zoom in, you can see the area where they generated data and they published an image. And now it's going to look a little more familiar to what they actually published. So now we see that little arc. I'm not sure what they call it. But that's the area that they generate data and publish an image. And if you want that data, there's a little box around it. And if you click on that box, ah, now we see on the left-hand side, this is the six filters they use to generate that data. And if you click on any one of them, I'm not going to download them here because I've downloaded them earlier. But if you click on one of these, click, it will think for a moment. And in the lower left, if you can see it, it is downloading that data. And if you click on all six of them, you will have all the data for the Carina Nebula that they use to generate the image that they published, probably the first image that came out of James Webb. So that's how you get the data. So what is it you're going to get? So we're not we're going to let this do its thing. In fact, why don't I just stop this since I already have this data? You're going to get the data from six far infrared filters that they use in James Webb. Remember, it's it is an infrared telescope looking back into the, the past. We all know about that. There is nothing in the visual range. So ultimately we're going to have to process this and put it in the visual range. And that's kind of what we're what I'm talking about this evening. So what are we going to get? On this tab over here, so these are the filters. These are some of the filters that we're downloading for this particular image. And I think we downloaded 90, 150, 200. So it was like one, two, three, four. I think these are the six filters that were downloaded. And you notice that they have colors, even though they're all infrared. And the reason they're illustrating them in colors is because that's how we're going to map them. That means that we're going to get the shortest wavelengths, and we're going to call those blue, even though we know it's far infrared, it's nothing we can see. And conversely, we're going to take the longest wavelength, it's 444, and we're going to map it to the redder colors. And that's how all the data is handled from the James Webb. That is, they map it from the shortest wavelength to the longest wavelength. 
at least they did it for the Carina Nebula. And so that's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to bring up Photoshop. And the reason I'm going to bring up Photoshop, if we can get it up here, Photoshop. There we go. So I took that downloaded data, and you can see that I processed it a few times uh, just for fun. In fact, I probably processed it about 10 times, because each time you process it, it comes out a little bit different. The sky is, or the proposed sky is not, not blue, maybe a little more purple, or that the um, nebula itself is a little or more or less orange, but it still comes out no matter how you process it, kind of what they published. So you've downloaded the data from James Webb from the Mikowski archive, from the MAST archive. You've taken it in the PixInsight. You've stretched it, and I just use a default stretch. I cropped a little bit of the edges so that you know the, the non-overlapped areas were eliminated. And I ended up with six TIFF images that I'm going to bring into Photoshop. Now, I'll use the magnifier where I can, or maybe if I ask Terry, then he'll, he'll do this for him. So I'm going to do something under File, uh, let's see, Scripts, Load File into Stack. If you've used Photoshop and you can't quite read this text, it's File, Scripts, Load Files into Stack. Oh, by the way, anyone want to keep track of my 10 minutes? You know, let's wait until I actually bring them into Photoshop and then start timing. So let me see if I can do it in 10 minutes. Load files into stacks. I'm going to browse. I've already got them lined up. And here we have the six filters. And if you can't read the notation, so here is the 90W filter. That is the shortest. And the longest one here is the 470. So these are the six filters. They're in TIFF format. They're default stretched in Photoshop. And I'm going to load them into a stack. And click OK. And so what I'm going to end up with, on the right-hand side, you see we have the Layers palette. And I'm going to end up with a file with six layers. And if you didn't notice when I opened those up, they were labeled one through six. And the reason I labeled them one through six on the left is so that when they were sorted, they were sorted from the shortest wavelength to the longest wavelength. Had I not done that, they would have been sorted alphabetically. So I just put one for the shortest, two for the next one, three, four, five, and six. And when they come into Photoshop, they're going to line up. Start. I think they're going to start with, yeah, let's see. They're going to start one, two, three, four, five, six when they all come in. And I'm going to have a stack of the six filters taken from the James Webb Space Telescope and default stretched in PixInsight and then save this too. So it's going to take us just a moment. Uh, we're up to four. And so the question is, what am I going to do next with this? How am I going to process this into an image? Now, when I initially did it, I said, OK, I'm going to kind of take you know, the, the rainbow colors, and I'm going to assign each one a special color. And then I'm going to map them into Photoshop in an image. And that took a long time. Uh, Tim Hutchison came up with a more clever way but it basically was the same thing. We're going to map the shortest one into the deep blue and the longest one into the deep red and all the other ones kind of in between. But we're going to do it differently. Now, if you want to start timing it, uh, now would be a good time to time it. So click, do we have a, I'm going to, I have a stopwatch here. I'm going to see if I can do this in 10 minutes. Okay, ready, set, go. I'll put my watch up here. So we now have our six images. And I'm going to unselect it so you can see each one. This is the longest wavelength. And they're progressively shorter and bluer as far as mapping goes. So I'm going to take all of these and put them into a folder. 
And then I'm going to copy that folder, and I'll tell you why we're doing this in a second. So this is going to be my luminosity folder. Luminosity, you say, well, you don't have luminosity in this. Uh, but you want luminosity because what you want to do is add these all up and use it as luminosity so that in the end, you have an image which gets rid of a lot of the artifacts. I don't know if you can see it, but some of these images have really funky star spikes because every facet on that telescope, on every mirror, contributes to this a, a little diffraction spike of its own. Let me see if I can just zoom in and maybe see one of these funky spikes. Uh, oh yeah, there they are. Look at those things. Because every facet of every mirror on the James Webb Space Telescopes generates a version of a, of a diffraction spike. And we got to somehow get rid of those. So here's how I came up to get rid of it. I'm going to start with the base one, the shortest wavelength, and I'm going to add in all the others in a way which is called lightning. So when I click on this, I'm going to say, if this, if any pixel in this image is lighter than the pixel below it, substitute it. If not, don't substitute it. And the way I do this is to select lightning as a way to merge these two layers. So each of these images, I'm going to put in and make it a lightning layer. Again, if there's a pixel in this image, which is lighter than the pixel below it, substitute. And number four, lightning layer. Number five, lightning layer. Oops, sorry, not normal, lightning layer. Number six, lightning layer. And so now we have an image which represents an addition of all of these in a way using the lightning function within, within Photoshop. And then I'm going to select all these layers and I'm going to say merge layers. And this is our luminosity. I'm hearing someone rattling. Okay, so now this is our luminosity, and it is different than each one of the images. It is a summation of those six images using the lightning function. And by doing that, a lot of those irregularities in the star spikes are gone. Let me zoom in on it. Oh, I zoomed too far. Let's try again. Doesn't get rid of all the artifacts, but it gets rid of a good many of them. So it averages out those star spikes so you don't get those thousands of little artifacts in each of the star spikes. At least it works for me. So how am I doing? Oh, I'm going more slowly. I gotta speed up if I'm gonna do this in 10 minutes. All right, we're gonna turn this off. So now let's go back to our six images below. So what Joe told me, instead of mapping each one of these images to a particular color in the visible spectrum, they just combined two, two, and two, and made one R, one G, and one B, and that was the end of it. So that's what I'm gonna do. And here's how I'm gonna do it. We're going to unselect everything but the bottom two. And I'm gonna say take 50% of this one. And merge it with the one below. And since that's the longest wavelength, I'm gonna call this, what color? We don't have an audience, but I think that's the longest one. So that should be red. Take these two, make the upper one 
I'm sure there are other ways to do this, but this worked. I'm going to merge it with the one below it. And this now becomes our green. Let's see. And the shortest wavelength, make the top one 50%. So we're taking 50% of that one, merging with the one below it. Merge down. And of course, that is rename blue. We have our luminosity. We have our red, green, and blue layers. And we are almost done. How are we doing on time? Oh, six minutes. I think we're going to do it. All right. So let's take the blue layer. I'm going to mark it all. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to make a new document. I want a color document, not a grayscale. Create. And I paste it in my blue layer. And I go back, get my green layer. All copy. Go to my RGB image, and now I'm going to select channels, and I'm going to put this into the green layer. It's green. Well, it's not actually green, but you know what I mean. I'm going to go back and get, what did I get? For, I'll get the red. I think I got blue first. Mark all, copy. Go to my color layer, go to my channels, and put in red. Well, we're not quite there, but we're close. Look at that. We got kind of yellow orange down there and a blue sky. So let me go to the layers. I'm going to make a copy of this layer because I'm going to do a little adjustment of the histogram. I'm going to go up to Image, Adjustment, just bring up the levels. And over here, I'm going to, you know, where is our channels navigation? Hist oh, yeah, I want, to, I want to look at the histogram. I'm going to try to balance this out a little bit, and you can see what's going to happen. The red. Uh, let's go, no data here. Bring this up a little bit. Oh, we're creeping up on this thing, aren't we? Red, green. Now, of course, when you get to this point, what you actually do is strictly up to you. I'm going to get rid of a little bit of the blue because I think it's a little high. Hmm, we're getting darn close. Let's make a little more red in this. So now we've made it, I think we're almost there. Uh, one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to choose another color palette. I'm going to assign a profile, which I know is going to be a little bit brighter. Okay, wow, well, look at that. We are really close to what they published. But we also see all these little dark centers in the stars. I don't know if you can see them. Let me zoom in on that. And how are we going to get rid of those things? And you can see all these funky spikes where every facet of the mirror is representing these little dots and dashes. We don't want that. Now, what did we do before, which is going to help get rid of this? We made a luminosity layer. So let me go back and get that. Um, where is our layers palette? Here's our luminosity. Let me copy that. Let's go back and paste that in. Uh, you know it's luminosity. Call it luminosity. Look at that. 
We're almost there. One thing I do want to do, I'm just going to darken this up a little bit. Let me give it a little more drama. And, well, how much time is it? Gosh, darn it, 10 minutes and 49, 50 seconds. I thought I could do it faster than that. So basically, once you get the data from James Webb, you download it, you bring in the into PixInsight, you do a uh, default stretch, you crop it a little bit so it's all registered. And if you bring it into Photoshop, and I'm sure there's a way of doing this in PixInsight, which is more or less the same, you can generate an image which is approximately the same as the one they published. In fact, in some ways, I don't think they really got this little red guy here quite as dramatically. And most of the artifacts, not all of them, some of them still need a little touch up, are not there anymore. So that is James Webb Space Telescope, Carina Nebula, in 10 minutes. Uh, were there any questions that came up along the way? Because uh, I didn't stretch very much, but uh, I think uh, we've demonstrated. We and, oh, I see a couple of questions. Go ahead. Yeah, there were a couple of questions. Uh, one of them you you spoke to a bit, but it was a question about the uh, uh, Marsha asked, what was the advantage of using Photoshop over PixInsight? You did mention that you thought you could theoretically do it in PixInsight as well, but I don't know about 10 minutes. Uh, the advantage is 30 years of experience with Photoshop. And <laughs> I don't mean to be advantage. glib about that, but I have been using Photoshop since, actually, I think it's 29 years. I don't want to exaggerate. But I've been using Photoshop since version one. I'm sure there's a way of doing this, basically, to create the same kind of thing of combining images. You could do it by pixel math, put them together, uh, do a combination by adding everything together in some way and coming up with a luminosity and come up with the same result. It's just that I have more experience with Photoshop. And, and when I talk to the people at the Space Telescope Science Institute, that's what they said they did. So I just followed their lead. They said they were using Photoshop as well? Yeah, I know Joe uses Photoshop. I think they use a combination. I think a lot of the processing is done in PixInsight or their own software. But I think all the finished images. By the way, there's one other thing. And let me show you a real cheat. And I know they do this. And uh, please don't tell anyone else that I told you this. So It'll just be our I, secret. I, yeah, just will just be our secret. Um, if you take this image and you blur it, it looks better and gets rid of the, a lot of the nonsense in it, a lot of those artifacts. I would never tell anyone to blur an image, but somehow it does make it look a little bit better because you still have some of these artifacts in here. But if you, again, I'm just going to take... Oh, why does it do that? All that experience, and it still does things I don't understand. I'm going to take the luminosity. All right, click, click. Make a copy of it. And if I just, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of rattling around on the other end. So if I just take this, filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and blur this two pixels. This is a big image, by the way. It's like, I don't know, 9,000 pixels. Now, somehow things look better. No, it's still blurring. Blurred. Now, I'm not recommending this, but I know and I heard that some of the images they published actually get blurred a little bit because they look better. Again, all the images they publish with this space, from the Space Telescope Science Institute, they're for the public. The science is done on, on the base images. It's not done on the published images. Just the published images kind of illustrate a lot. I see there was another, what is causing the black dot? Oh, uh, they're too bright. And it just, we asked that question. It just runs over. 
if this reaches the limit. So the easiest way to do it is just to make them black. I can tell you a very clever solution to the black dot issue. Actually adding them all together takes care of it. But I know that there's a black dot down here. So again, don't tell anyone I ever did this. If we take, if you want to close your eyes, you can. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, I don't mean to joke about this. This is serious business. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's not serious business. It is fun business. I just take a little paintbrush. Oh, no, don't do that. I thought maybe you were going for the healing brush or something, spot healing brush. I just messed up the image. There's black dot gone. What did it, what did I do? I made a big glitch in my image. You just painted white right on that. Yeah. I just, I just painted white, black dot gone. And there were a few black dots that didn't get taken care of by making the luminosity. Black dot gone. Let me zoom back out. Yes, we wondered about the black dots. Stars are too bright, and so it just cuts off and it just registers as black. No information. Any questions? Everyone has the link so they can go and download any of this data. And you can get any of the images from James Webb. You can get any of the images from the Hubble Space Telescope. You can get any images from almost any of the telescopes that you want to and download them. It, it's like any database. It takes a little getting used to to uh, find where everything is. But other than that, it's public data financed by the government. And any of us can use it no matter where in the world we are. Any more questions about this? Oh, you want to see what a, the actual image looked like? I think I have it here somewhere, what they published. Mm -hmm. Eric, while you're looking for that, I want to point out that um, Bob Gendler has, um, I've seen a several presentations from him, where he has downloaded information from various telescopes and uh, done just what you're just talking about. And uh, the reason I bring it up is because that is an example of diverse data. The very kinds of things I was talking about earlier uh, in the tutorial is you, you do have to register those things. You'll have to crop a lot of things. You'll have to normalize and all that other stuff. But you can take diverse data from various space telescopes, add it to your own or add it to each other. You can do all that stuff with some of the stuff I was talking about earlier. Yeah, and actually, by the way, I, I just brought up the, the actual published image. Their colors are a little deeper, so I mean, if I really wanted to, to reproduce what they're doing, I suppose I could. I could go back in here and, yeah, their, their oranges are a little more orange. But I, again, at this point, you're just trying to make it fit your eye. And if you want your sky a little bluer, make it a little bluer. And if you want your nebula a little more orange, you can do that too. In fact, I can. Here's a little trick that I have in here. I think, let's see, tone mapping adjustment. I have a little, I just made it a little, oh, well, it's thinking. Yeah, with everything going on, is it done? Yeah, I made it a little more orange, a little more white, but that's a matter of taste. There is no right or wrong. They're just representing the data in some way by mapping it onto the color palette that we can see. And whether you do it my way or you do it six filters, uh, you'll get a result which is very similar to what they publish. Can we stop sharing or is more people? Uh, there's another question. What is the typical download time and file size? I think the file size is like 250 meg and I can download it each one in about less than a minute. 